Thank you. Thank you. Need a little. Keith, can you hear me all right? Okay. Can you guys hear me in the back? Lauren, can you hear me? Can you, you guys can hear okay? Okay. I'm not trying to interrupt anybody's. Well, I actually am trying to interrupt you. I'm lying. Um, let's get started. It's already after seven o'clock, and um, I know you guys are, are dying to hear Kristen read her work. So um, thank you for being here. I am Jen Lynn. I think every single one of you know me, and I am so thankful that you are all here. Um, I am the, the director of Lit Fuse. A, in the past, Lit Fuse has been a, a workshop that happens every September. We bring in poets from all over, all over the Northwest and even beyond the Northwest. At this point, we've we've had um, we've had great like Natalie Diaz has been with us, um, Paisley Rectal, um, uh, goodness, the list goes on and on. And Ilya Kaminsky. Ilya Kaminsky. Yeah, I was here uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, we've it's, uh, what maybe 30, 40, 50 poets at this. In fact, um, Joanna, our own Joanna Thomas was there for one year. Um, and we've, we've got a great lineup this year, and, um, but we are now moving into a little bit more year-round programming and bringing in, um, extending the Lit Fuse love. So thank you for being here tonight. We had a great, great time last month with Raul Sanchez, and tonight we have Kristen Berger with us. Um, so before we get started, I do want to, um, I do want to make some acknowledgments. Titan Arts and Humanities resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation. Titan Arts and Humanities values relationships that, that reinforce our commitment to art as a powerful tool for e equity and diversity. And recognizing the history and respecting the sovereignty of Washington, Washington's Indian nations, Titan Arts and Humanities recognizes and honors these first people and their significant role today in stewarding these lands as they continue to honor and uphold their ancient heritage. Thank you for attending the Titan Arts and Humanities Fuel, our new monthly reading series, Open Mic Night. This event is free and open to the public. Um, would also like you to come back next month, July, I can't remember exactly the date. Um, it's July, it's the fourth Wednesday. This, this is gonna be happening the fourth Wednesday of every month. Um, I already talked about the Lit Fuse workshop. I hope to see you all there. We have an incredible lineup this year. Um, 27th. July 27th, next month will be July 27th, Wednesday. Also wanna thank our sponsors, Poetry Foundation, Humanities Washington, National Endowment for the Humanities, Washington State Art Commission, National Endowment for the Arts, Fresh Hop Ale Festival, Yakima Chief Hops, uh, Deskiran Foundation, Yakima Valley Community Foundation, Inklings Bookstore, Fiesta Foods, and Yakima Coffee House Poets. Excuse me, I don't usually have things on my phone. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm a little bit of the older generation, don't usually rely on my phone, so bear with me. So our poet tonight, Kristen Berger, is the author of six poetry collections, and I know she did bring some of her stuff with her, so please um, peruse her books and support her, um, including Changing Woman, Changing Man, A High Desert Myth, um, Refugia, Ec Echolocation, How Light Reaches Us, and Earthwork, forthcoming from the Poetry Box in August 2022. Recipient of residencies from Playa, OSU's Shot Pouch, H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest, and Starkey Experimental Forest and Range, Kristen's work is influenced by all Pacific Northwest wild and interconnected landscapes. A former member of the Women Identified Editorial Collective, Voice Catcher, and a co-host of the Lentz Farmer's Market Poetry Series, which she lovingly invited me to a few years ago, Kristen believes in the resiliency and impact of art and writing through and sustained by community. Kristen lives in Portland, Oregon, and you can visit her at kristenbergerpoet.com. And please give a round of applause, warm welcome to Kristen Berger. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen, for inviting me. I was so excited to um, be summoned 
up here. We met in Ellensburg um, in 2019 at the last Poetry Prowl, and um, before it was before COVID hit, and that's where I met Jen and um, many of you in the room. And it was um, it made an impact just to see this community up here that would travel from Yakima to Ellensburg and from all over to come for um, for poetry specifically. And it was um, it. I'm just happy to be back and to meet some of you again. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from a book that's coming out. So I don't have it with me, um, but I did bring my publisher's QR code so you can go online and check it out. Um, it's all dig digitized. Um, so it's Earthwork, which um, I was talking with Jen about the poems, you know, not actually doing a whole lot of writing right now, but a lot of the poems in this book um, somehow got written during the pandemic. I don't really remember writing too many poems, um, and many were from many years before. Um, and they were, they were poems mostly about my children, about um, death and you know, family that never fit into other collections. Um, I had to have a chat book that was really focused on my, my children. Um, and then never could find a way to get these um, together. And so um, it really actually took some moments in the pandemic to sort of round out some of those experiences. And it was because I was home with my kids 24 seven for <laughs> the better part of those uh, two years. So um, I'm gonna read a few of those tonight. And they're not all about my kids, but um, I'm gonna start with a poem that, as I was driving in, the topography here is nothing like the place I was raised, which is in Michigan, and I was raised in Detroit, and then had, um, we have a little family cabin in northern Michigan, and so nothing is similar. But driving here, just looking at these big fields of lupin and the, the sloping hills, as a child, when we would drive anywhere, I just imagined myself somehow jumping out of the car onto a horse and taking off. <laughs> and that's how it felt today, just coming up the valley. Um, just it lets your imagination go, it lets your, your body actually just wants to, to follow the, the curves of the hills. So this is called Passenger. Remember drawing lop-logged hearts onto a fogged window with a hot finger? the small miracle of breath opaquing the world for just a few moments, while the hills of the heart descended in drips before you had a chance to strike an arrow through, take a sleeved elbow to swipe, see snow zeroing in, inhale, exhale, start all over. From the back seat as a child, I could find my way north to our cabin, no directions but by the sprucing of the skyline the way bridges thin their spans, and farmland filled with the pulse of oil wells, blue and gold beacons in the rearview mirror. Like campfires, I would gallop my imaginary horse to, if not for all the fences gritting the, sky, the horizon. There are details of the story we drive away from, like a disappearing river or a spouse's love. I learned my way like the fiery warblers retracing their route from somewhere hot and south along the same spine of road and ditch, the scent of pines imprinting on us a safe, sandy habitat around the hemisphere's bend, some home just out of reach, landscape rolling that appeared when I cranked the window down, let heart slip into the car door's sealed sleeve, snowy air rushing in, something solid, a name to press my lips to. The theory I'm conspiring to share. Love is truth. The heart is a muscle. Children flex it without thought from birth. They swell with this knowledge. Kindness is not fake. After a hurricane, first responders don't ask anyone's political party or ask for documentation, not even your name. Only, can you hear me? We are here. We, come, we become leveled down to bare bones, 
humanity on the shore like a strange day-lit animal. Love is a muscle like water. It wants what it wants. We are wired from birth to share it, not hoard it. Take love to places it's never been. Get off the block. Step across borders. We share this ancient breath under these lights, on this corner, on this night. Don't be afraid of taking it all in. Scarcity is a fear tactic. Gathering is necessary. This is indulgence, and it's OK. In the most crowded aisle of the Goodwill, a mother of an adult with disabilities picks out a shirt, and he is overjoyed at the dogs on the front. Dogs begin our human conversations. Help us when we think we have nothing to say. Traffic stops for the oldest resident of the neighborhood, and soup grows with each item cut and added, often beginning with stones. It's OK to cry in public. We want to help you stand. My grandparents would not recognize this country rancid with fear. My grandmother kept the kitchen tidy and hugged anyone who she had just met. The kitchen sink attracts plate after plate and upturned times. Habit is like that. But love could be like that, too. I have no answers. This is not a theory, really, a hunch, a hope, that this poem is far from being written, that you will help me finish it. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit. I was um, talking with Scott on my way up. We were talking about our grandparents, and so I'm going to read a little poem about my grandmother. Um, who volunteered at a hospital after she retired. Is there someone trying to come in? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and I miss her very much. So I'm going to read this poem. The Hospital Volunteer. Tuesdays, she checks into the gift shop and snaps up the pink smock piped in blue, fills her cart with everything the sick upstairs might need, playing cards for men in recovery, comic books for children with no hair, Soft white bears for ladies missing their dogs. People for women waiting for labor to kick in. She is clockwork, cheer on wheels. Not a nurse at their station doesn't know her name. Alice, embroidered in scarlet, the smock full up to her neckline with roses, stars, and hearts she wears like congressional medals, knocking on doors as if each patient were a guest every gift in her cart, free of charge. Um, I'm going to read a poem. I, I was contemplating not reading it because it's such a beautiful, sunny solstice night, and everything feels very, like, keep it up and, you know, festive. But um, it's a grief poem, so why not bring in a little darkness? Um, and it's about my father, but um, we recently just had uh, my uncle passed away a couple weeks ago. So this one's sort of, um, I just need to read it, if that's okay. Breath work. Something reminded me today that a parent of mine had died, and the barometric pressure fell, and rain began to touch the river. I had displaced this fact like a small boat folded by children's hands. February's amnesia had me feeling so free, Indian plum purling the forest and light returning to hold moss committed to trunks. I was reminded that grief lives in the lungs, and the lungs live to nourish the limbs with their breathfall, misting cascade, their quiet avalanching of stormy breath. I sat by his side as a plastic mass contained his exhales, his last attempt at words, his lungs filling with tumors, with fluid. Meeting his astonished eyes, I inhaled for the both of us. Hospital vents released vapor into the snow-lit night, a waterfall in reverse. Chinese paintings exist of such landscapes, that cliff-to-river way we live, bottomless, 
Grief, a river we inhabit, never reaching its mouth. River within, rising to meet, carry this small passenger. So this um, poem was influenced by Instagram. <laughs> um, there was a Hurricane Matthew, which at this point I can't remember when that was, so I'm thinking it was back in 2017. Memory is really weird. Um, but it was a post uh, by a meteorologist who had identified birds in the eye of a hurricane. And his little caption just, I, I took that. And I don't know that I ever said thank you for it, but I'm thanking him now. Um, and the, the little um, tag was, morning radar shows eye over water with biological returns, probably birds inside. Centripetal force. Her body finds mine, pit of night, no hour belonging to her orbiting, fever dreams running away, running towards, into the familiar cove of shoulder, arm, breast, down blanket up and over us, both like a sudden deep wave. She says, we'll all be living under a bubble in 50 years. She begs, why can't we just eat the air and do no harm? The weekend storms, storm spins its wheels, Thunder and lightning tiring of their game of tag. He comes into the bed, too, for the other side. Bodies flanking me like not quite uprooted trees. Nightmares losing heat in my arms. He mumbles, did you know every five seconds someone is born and someone has died? He assures, from space we must look like fireflies. His cropped hair has grown out enough to swirl away from sweaty temples. Her face returns to the upturned hope of a newborn. Round breaths lengthen their, sp their spines. In dreams, they are always taking the unburdened long ways home. So um, this one, so that was when my kids are really little and my oldest is 18, going on 19, and still climbs into bed <laughs> when they're scared. But um, the, the pandemic had this way of bringing us together that at times was completely suffocating and you know, maddening. I think for a lot of people experienced that. But um, I just bought a big couch to accommodate all of the time we spent together. And because um, my kids were getting bigger, we were watching a lot of TV. And at times when online school was just um, just kind of too too much. We just indulged in um, in watching shows, and um, I learned how to eat grapefruit, like the way like to like it. And it was by I'd always had it with sugar, you know, with like little scooping spoons. And my kid one day just started peeling a grapefruit and peeled it to the point where all of the like, the rind and everything it, it looked really gross. Mm -hmm. I was so it was like the best thing. So now I don't actually peel my own grapefruit. I have my kid do it for me. So that's what this is about. It's a big build up to this poem. Peeling grapefruit. Most about this lost pandemic year, I hope will fade. The trauma and the chaos, the uncertainty of our lives hemmed or stopped altogether. The sleeplessness and the tinny chords of exhaustion playing us, tuning us into people we turning us into people we sometimes don't recognize, catching our reflection in a friend's porch window. I want to hold this time as if it were a globe we pass around, take each other's burden, turn over the marks of isolation that scarred our surface, where beauty still cracked through. I will not want the whole of it to pass away, not the children living under one roof and under wing coming out of their rooms after class to stand like neighbors and say, how are you doing today? We divide the hours like a math problem. We tease and coax and trouble and never understand the sum. What is real and what is remote? 
Where does mother end and child begin? Too much of the year I could not shelter them from. Somehow we still want to be together, sitting on the couch for something mindless like glee. My oldest peels a grapefruit, turning the blushing sun over and over to find the right spot to drive a nail, separate pith from taut capsules, sweeter than spooning it with sugar, sections equally divided and passed down, so quickly eaten, each of us asking for more, please. I know I had a request, but I think I'm not going to read that one, if that's okay. I'll read you another one, though. <laughs> um, so I did write some poems, and I never titled them. I just numbered them. This is day 365. <laughs> Irises score earth open in quiet, daylit strokes, not one at a time, but in communal agreement, underground timepieces. Bulbs electrifying each other in soil's loamy, sunless dream. Even the crow's suddenness between pre-spring branches above the dentist's parking lot can't compare to such brilliance. We are all emerging from the emergency. I take off the sunglasses they make you wear in the hydraulic chair, maskless and hopeful at the high blue view, and know that when we get to kiss again, it will be like the iris. No earth will hold us back. What is that? Magical sound. <laughs> Time to fill up your wine glass. <laughs> That's awesome. I don't mind a little back music. It might like. um, it's so funny. My book is called Earthwork, but for the longest time I forgot the title and I thought it was called Earthbridge. So I'm going to read the title, the book that the poem that I thought was the title poem for the longest time, and then I looked at it and I'm like, wait a minute. So that's how confusing things got in the pandemic. Earthbridge. Dear world, where would I be without you? Under the green blue river, pillowing clay banks, river slitting through milky fog, clear as day. I can see all the ways forward and behind, nests in leafless cottonwoods poised to clutch an eagle, a heron. I want to hold someone without thinking. How you pin me between here and there, that unreachable island. Dear blue envelope, please don't spill. Contain this love for the other side. Be the foothold, my submerged terra firma. Keep us on the span when the water goes down. Um, I think I have time. I'm going to read one that... Um, was thinking about this time we were in Arizona, giving a reading in Phoenix, and then in Tucson. And um, the trip involved a little excursion up to Mount Lemmon, up Sky Island Highway, which is this great road that goes through, I think, eight different ecosystems or something. It just keeps going, and it's every... Um, Switchback has some new miracle of a terrain, so um, this is a poem for that place. And it was much like driving up here, because I've never been this far, so every new turn was this amazing place that will, I think it'll just be etched, and it'll be another poem, and I'll come back and I'll read it. Sky Island Highway. Where wind muscles hoodoos and torques mesquite, altitude switchbacks the thumbprint of time. We drive into a slot of blue shade and the road loses us. 100 million years of sun, press earth, and oracle granite keeps its poise. Light is only a day old. We are still young. 
Snow will settle like mica where the moment buckles, and it will come and it will be deep. Air stills, thousands of unknown species fold their hearts and secreted limbs into the vermilion peaks of each other. Crickets, miles below, purr to the arroyos. Soon it will be time to lift ourselves and hold resin-stained hands, boulder hop to the car. We will turn a clean descent, lean into valley heat cradled by the weight of old stars. How unalone a constellation of aspens quivering with no wind makes us. Thank you. So did you eat your grapefruit without sugar in the end? Oh yeah. Okay. I never do again. Uh, I just didn't never do again. Enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Oh, it's wonderful to hear some, some new poems of yours. Um, Kristen will be available at the end. We're, we're going to open up the mic now, but um, she has agreed to do some, some Q&A at the end. So, you know, if you have other questions about things like grapefruit or whatever, <laughs> um, she would be happy to answer those. Um, this is being recorded, and I, I hope everybody noticed there was a, a spot to check for um, if you didn't want to be recorded, which so if there's a couple of you that I'm gonna bump to the end if you don't mind because if we if we stop then it um, it disrupts the broadcast and it'll be a rebroadcast towards the end for the Q and A, so which is which is fine. I just hope you don't mind being taken down to the bottom. Okay, perfect. Um, well, then let's go ahead and get started and hear some more beautiful poems. Um, Lauren Imbrock, can you, you want to come up and share with us? <laughs> and my pen name is my first poetry book entitled Art Anchorite and an anchorite is a religious recluse or an ascetic person so during COVID I was this art anchorite who just always stayed home and wrote poetry and made art and I'm also really passionate about religion and this poem Up High was inspired by Rosalia, a Spanish singer, and she has a song called Con Otura. And thank you so much for listening. Up High by Platinum Owl. My third eye blinks blue. Up high, blue flowers and carrots. Your blue ring sighs. Bicycle Santorini. I keep hoping that you will come back to me when I went inside this glass terrarium. Stained glass, all the same. Lighted pieces like a lamp, a gorgeous green shone through. Blue rhapsody wrapping around me like a powder blue coat, mink coat, blue neon. I want the flowers, I want the sun, I want the warmth, I want the rays from the aqua water. To give all of yourself and to only receive halves in return. Thank you. And um, this poem is entitled Don't Believe the Hype, and I wrote it last week after doing yard work. <laughs> <laughs> Don't Believe the Hype by Platinum Owl. The sky is blue and full of God's consciousness, the green lusciousness of the valley in the prime time of my life, obliged for money, weeding, feeling like an Israelite shoveling sod for flower beds as an Israelite building the pyramids. The thunder booms overhead and a hot, dry ghibli. My back hurts when she hears, starting now by Brandy. She dreams, free to dream, David Beckham. Lord, deliver me to the promised land, she thinks. In the promised land in Italy, it's more freedom. The promised land is a new home and I'm world renowned. Back breaking weeding in June and bushes to prune as the landscaper outside is fine with a sharper shovel. But in the pain, it's enough to have a come to Jesus moment starting right now. Starting over a life coach and a song for Cinderella to show up as her highest self, Patty Smith, right now. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren. That was that was great. Um, Jonpa, can you please come up and share with us? Are you ready? start with the base. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Are you recording this? <coughs> this is poem called The Cough. <coughs> <coughs> it may occur while there are words as well. But that's oh, poetry. It's, 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 it's a rhyme. <coughs> <coughs> I think I'm joking. It's a hundred years since T.S. Eliot published The Wasteland. One hundred years today. Some of us. Things were pretty wasted after the First World War. And things are fairly wasted at the moment, if I may say so. Impermanence, Satori yesterday, diarrhea today, all things pass. <laughs> I mean, just a bit of Basho, it was just a little play on Basho. The bass, right? This is from, um, well, we appropriated the wasteland, so this is from the third section called Burning Down the House. So, in this sense, the house is poetry. And Eliot was a Dadaist, if you notice at the end of the wasteland, the thunder says, Da, Da. Da. From the med, on meds, heading towards dead, filled with espresso. Elliot was into um, Tantric Buddhism and Hinduism. This is a poem based on the Tantric um, Dzogchen, which is the great perfection or the great completion. So in this sense, everything is complete. And this poetry is and complete, and all that's left is poetics. So I'm going to do poetics, since poetry is complete. The source from whence this poem inspiration need to fulfill a promise result of a prayer or a habit. Inspiration, a flooding feeling of bliss, or the zone, an exterior vision, an interior vision, an apocalyptic need to write like crazy, the base. The base, the path, the fruit, the path. Make a poem. We've come to bring you metaphors for your poetry. A mind treasure, the Tibetans call it a tear. 
build like a box, make a poem, a grail, a grail for Gail, for her birthday, an occasion, first word, best word, beauty, outside, beauty, channeled, ghosts, Martians. I write a lot in Martian. <laughs> These are Martian poems, or they're poems from demons, or they're poems from beat angels. Lauren is a beat angel. She gave me this poem. It's a mind tear. Tear it. Magic poetry is spelling poetry. Casts spells. Spelling poetry is spelling. I dance the dance of King Gessar. Somehow things come together. It brought its own solution, which was very poetic. Taught me to draw a bunny. Saying something is more appropriate than you could dream of. Saying something more profound, even if you don't get it. The crow story. How he got a drink. In the poem, I was able to cry. To name it kills it. My cat died the other day. First you shear the poem, and then you stamp it. You don't want to miss the point. Capture phrases that come to mind. The occasion arises by the occurrence. And then you somehow write it in an antique land. Stuff comes into life that haunts you. Things I said I shouldn't have. Things I said I could have said better. Things other people said. It was a beautiful day. And I want to remember it. Misery comes from every direction. Whatever are we going to do about it? We can't always be watching TV. I feel like a blind man who doesn't know where he is. A seance, a book, a poem, a skit. Did you think the Kali Yuga was going to be easy? <laughs> poetry of the mind, poetry of the voice, poetry of the body. Quack, quack, quack. I'm not sure why you said that wasn't poetry, but it was poetics. But it was, yeah. Mm. We we have some more. We have, we I, we need to have a conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Jampa. Javier Cavazos, please come share with us. I just want to say thank you for being here. If you're here, it means you care about language. You care about poetry. 
Uh, you care about images, and um, it's so humbling and honoring to be here with, with my people. You know, from Jen to yeah. Rob to Joey to, to Jampa to Ed to Linda to Lisa, all my new friends, the Beat Angel, our endeared reader, Kristen Berger, who was phenomenal tonight, like very stunning and, and very, very, uh, very sensual poetry I thought was amazing. Scott, it's Scott, right? Scott, my new friend, and everyone here that supports language and the arts because uh, we're in Titan, Washington. And I just want to say that one more time. We're in Titan, Washington. And, 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 I want to, and I want to encourage us all to imagine an urban setting where we have this abandoned gas station turned into cultural center, turned into center for caring for kids, turned in for to people that care about humanity and the arts and and there's no place better than where we could be than right here right now and so I really thank you and thank you Jen for this series and for what you're doing for all of us um, don't call me a pig <laughs> although I have very piggish tendencies very fitting what is this yeah like so I'm going to read one poem, and I'm, I'm trying something different here. Is I, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with friends of mine that, you know, that, that um, are poets, and we talk often about how we have our set sort of routine of poetry that we read, that we think, like, I don't know, maybe I think, like, these five poems in this manuscript are, like, the best poems or whatever. So I'm just on a crusade to read things I've never read out loud and to try them out. Um, this is forthcoming in 2023 by the Cleveland State University Poetry Center. Um, and, um, and so I just want to try it out on you all. And we're in Yakima, or close to Yakima, Washington. And you know, a bit of a disclaimer is that every time I, every time I roll into Yakima, I feel like I'm going to get high. And whether that's true or not, like, like not just like weed high, but like real like really drugged high, you know, like, like a real high. And, and it's laughable, but it's also like really tragic. And um, The Devil's Workshop, one. I started to earthquake. The hit I shot in my arm was Grand Canyon, an airplane jump. Demon face and ghost scream. The hit was nonpartisan and nonprofit. What is this nonsense? I thought, how could this be nonprofit? This at least has to be QAnon. My body shaking violently, I grabbed onto the two sides of the white bathroom sink and started to zipper. I thought for sure my heart was going to pop. QAnon, capitalism, for profit, my heart cash rate bank account soaring. Investments too. NASDAQ over 30,000. I was holding on for life, shirtless, shoeless, bending at my knees, breathing in and out of my mouth like I was giving myself CPR, trying to slow everything down. Not to slip knot. Just survive the hit, I said, as the hit and dry blood brown carpet floor, the walls around me vibrating like a Heimlich maneuver of sound or sunlight. My own brain too, genesis, genus of addiction in heliotrope, wobbling back and forth, erect to the sun. Underneath my yellow tetranus sucking eye sockets, there it was, my demon face. Mom, mother, Monteca, 
I shouted again, hold me close, ayúdame. My two hands ready to rip the bathroom sink right off the wall. Breathe in, breathe out the wall beneath me. Breathe in. The quake wasn't slowing down. I wasn't going to make it. I looked up at the bathroom mirror again and looked into my demon face, a tiny wounded rabbit. I blinked my eyes and the glaucoma gazed demon face was gone and my heartbeat began to slow. Ayúdame, Jesucristo, ayúdame. how to move on from that. Um, what Hobbs said is right. Um, this, this is a beautiful space to be in and, and here with family. You're, you're, you're all family. And um, thank you for being vulnerable, Javier. Thank you for um, not just here, but in general and, and sharing and being a part of this family. And thank you both for being here and um, and from afar too, Jose, I appreciate you being here, all of you being here tonight. Um, we are gonna transition over to Ed Stover. Can you please come up and share with us? <clears throat> this won't be nearly as dramatic as what you just heard. <laughs> it's great, Paul. There we are. Great. On the stage. <clears throat> this is got to be cool. <laughs> at school, I look at the other boys, older guys like Lefty Miller and Punk Johnson, and they've got these greasy ducktail haircuts. You know, duck sass, DA, where the hair on the sides of the head is combed back in this cool, feathery, duck sass sort of way. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror. Short, pudgy, baby cheek me, with my uncool mop of hair, and I'm thinking, what the heck am I going to do with that? So I start fooling around, combing it in various ways, parting it down the middle, and stuff until I come up with this really neat do. Two mounds of hair separated by a part that is topside instead of in the back. It is very weird. And I think very cool. So first I show it to my mother, whose initial reaction is to put her hand over her mouth and kind of giggle. My little sister just stare at me. And the older one asks mom why big brother has funny hair. I see I decide I need more feedback. And since it's Saturday and there's no school, I decide to go where I know the fire will at least be friendly fire. I grease up with brill cream. A little dab will do you. Comb my do just so, and I walk downtown to my uncle's hardware store. I walk in, and my uncle Les stares at me and says, what the hell is that on top of your head? I tell him it's this new kind of haircut called a duck's ass that's real cool in school, only mine is a little different. And he says, duck's ass my ass. He wraps me in a headlock with one arm, grabs a brand new pair of horseshoes off the rack with the other, and snip, snip, turns my duck's ass hairdo into like I'd been whacked in the head with an ax, leaving this big ugly chop where my DA had been. What you need is a real man's haircut, says Uncle S, pointing to his own military buzz cut, and he walks me across 6th Street at, to Benedetti's barber shop, where Sam and Bert Benedetti, who, Bert Benedetti, who are father and son, cut the hair of practically every man and boy in town. And Les tells Bert, who was also scoutmaster of Boy Scout Troop 33, which is my Boy Scout troop, to give me a real man's haircut. 
And even now, in my old man's reverie, I am sitting in that chair in Benedetti's barber shop, and I am listening to the snick, snick, snicking of Bert's scissors in my ear, and the brill-creamed remnants of my duck's ass haircut are littering the floor around me. And my uncle is watching me and chuckling, and there is a warm sparkle in his eyes, and there seems to be a sound like music in the air. But I'm sure that's memory playing tricks on me. All of this happened long, long ago. And you would never hear music in a real man's barber shop, not in 1952, no way. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Um, Rod Nelson, will you come up and share with Rod, us? Rod, yeah, baby. You guys are hard acts to follow, man. This is great poetry tonight. You can do it. I'm just gonna do. I'm gonna do a love poem tonight. I've done it once on Zoom. I've never done it live, so this is my uh, my love poem. It's called a lament from the summer Elvis died. Let's hope I can get through it. Three days gone, she steps out of the evening twilight into the street light on my corner and drops a cherry in my glass. Just for you, she says, and leaves in the morning a frightened deer dodging headlights on the highway. And I'm back to third page news in her soap opera diary with no key, no plans, to break out of this heartbreak hotel. Five days later, she's back, home to stay, but no bag in her hand, her clothes in a distant closet. Yet I have no resistance to her existence at my door, so she loves me tender and leaves with a promise, a kiss and a smile. And I'm back in the queue again, waiting for that late night call from a crosstown bar. Too many margaritas to make it home tonight. And me with no courage to say, just stay with the one you're with. But the clouds lift. The rain stops. The seas part. And she's back on my step, our step, bag in hand, together again. My smile again reflected in the morning mirror for a day, a week, a fortnight, until she comes late to our bed, drunk with confessions, angry at my angst. The angle of repose exceeded. Her makeup disappears from the cabinet. And I'm back walking the streets, wandering the lonely streets of solitaire. Was I a fool to rush into that surprise touch on my back from the crowd? turning to embrace that sweet smile. There was nothing in the lessons of my youth, of love and the sharp angles of lopsided triangles, only how love was served by the caressing curves of circles and ovals, unprepared by the myriad of voices that said, go forth, do good, my lighthouse, my hopes for knighthood, disappear below the horizon. A day, a week, a fortnight, a call and a bullion to ask, can my main man come visit? Sure, just hang a chain around my neck. My motorbike takes me to her new neighborhood on the hill. We make tabletop love, then she plays, here come those tears again, commandeering my grief in her schadenfreude moment. And her thin smile evokes an epiphany. There are no angles of triangles here, no caressing curves, just love's death rattles. The pounding of the bodies, the writhing of the flesh cannot beat these shards into beach glass. In the morning, a voice, my voice from nowhere, time to go for good. She passes over my Damascene moment with a squinted smile. Did you hear? Elvis just died. The key to my motorbike in my right front pocket. 
No more, love me tender. No more, don't be cruel. An early morning elegy echoes through the empty streets back home. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> um, yes, it, it has been, it's a great night of poetry. Um, Jack? Where's Jack? Jack, I am sorry, how do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Radozovich. Radozovich. Please, please come share your uh, poetry. Talking with my fellow uh, Joanne, who's also of Croatian ancestry. My grandparents came here uh, around the turn of the 20th century and um, settled in Tayyip, by the way. So, uh, I'm going to read two short poems here tonight. Um, I'm going to preface that with a capsule history of my life story. I was, I was born here in Tyatt, and I grew up here in Tyatt for the first 10 years of my life. I lived here. Uh, then we moved out to my family's orchard where I grew up, and then later as a um, farmed it myself. And one of the Interesting things to me, uh, while I was farming, while I was riding around on <clears throat> my tractor, I was always writing these little poems. I didn't know if anything would ever come of them, but I, I kept writing them anyway. And um, at one time, actually, I actually sent uh, apples into the Kobley Larson warehouse where they packed my apples, and um, um, anyway, time goes on. We sold an orchard, I moved on to other things, but I kept writing poems. And then about 15 years ago, I saw this, uh, where this poetry workshop was in the um, old Kobley Lawson warehouse. It was called uh, Mighty Tyad and Warehouse, and um, so um, I'm going to read two poems. One about when I was farming, in late 60s, early 70s, about when um, I was sending apples into the Cobley Larson warehouse. And then I'm going to read a poem that I read at the open mic at the first Lit Fuse. Um, this is called Life on the Run. We lived on a carousel till we were in our teens. We grew up on the tinsel dreams of movie kings and queens. But suddenly the fairy tale could not fulfill our needs. So we went out to find the source of that on which life feeds. We latched onto a hurricane, went whirling through the sky, like children on a Ferris wheel who think they've learned to fly. But what goes up must come down. We were dropped behind the lines and went spinning through the underground in the caverns of our minds. And all we ever wanted was to live life on the run and pretend we were undaunted when we saw the setting sun. You can't cheat life, the old man said. You can't keep running free. There's something there that owns your soul. It's called humanity. You think you can't outrun yourself by living in a dream, but you can't ignore the suffering eyes or the echo of their scream. But the old man was a simple fool and we had all the time, and if you're running fast enough, you don't know it's a crime. But what we do holds us here while the world keeps turning round, and we pass by our memories each time the sun goes down. And all we ever wanted was to live life on the run and avoid the ghosts that haunted when we saw the setting sun. And, um, this, um, I, I want to say, I don't know if you've ever seen Ed Marquand's um, collection of printing presses in the warehouse. If you ever get a chance to see it, go see it. So anyway, at the very first lit fuse, they had a letterpress option you could take. 
and I know Ed, Ed uh, Stover and I both did that. And um, so I had written this poem, uh, and I was going to learn how to uh, do letterpress and print it out. Well, doing letterpress is, is pretty hard. It's upside down and backwards, um, so it takes a little longer. So I couldn't print this poem, so I had to print something else a lot smaller. But I did read this poem at the open, first open mic of Lit to Use. Um, it's called Field of Stone. Would you come to me if fate had left me all alone? If I were le lying in a field of stone, would you kneel and anoint my brow and then somehow brush my lips and breathe life into me? Would you come to me if life had chilled me to the bone, if misfortune had stripped me of all I own, if I were drowning in an unrelenting sea, imprisoned by an unforgiving eternity, would you whisper in my ear that I might hear once again a symphony? And it says, insert symphony here, so you'll have to imagine the symphony. <laughs> if life had chilled me to the bone, as fortune taken all I own, Fate had left me all alone if I were lying in a field of stone. Would you come to me when the race was run, if it had been won? Would you close my eyes that I might realize behind the darkest night there is a sun? Jack, thank you so much. What an honor to have you here with your history in, in this area and, well, and with uh, Lit Fuse. I can, I can bore you to tears with stories of time if anybody is interested. Think of Audrey Theodore Rutke and Richard Hugo. Yeah. All into a living presence of you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Scott, would, yeah. you, would you mind coming up and sharing your poem with us? Scott. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you for the community and for inviting us here to read. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, give, I'll try to give you three short poems, and if we're lucky, they'll be spelling poems. Nice. Spelling. Spelling, spelling yeah. Nice. Apprentice. The most powerful life skill is eye contact. You can start or stop a fight with that. Sooth saying is easier than it looks, but harder than you think. You can stop writing poems, but that does not stop the poems. I want to go down in history and bring back a future worth remembering. Joy for no reason is the greatest wealth. This much is true. So say it to Soothsaying. Us and them. When the power goes out, an older power switches on. Your heart pounds in the dark, the walls fade or fall away. The animal leaps from the wall and brushes against you. The cairns we leave behind, the moon knocks over. We frack and pollute, we lubricate earthquakes. The mind is the only object that retains our bearings. Very soon, this will be a long time ago. <laughs> uh, succulent ornamentation. When the, vi when the virus finally mutates into a rain-soluble sugar, shrivels into non-matter, lifts off, and returns to the 14th century, let's socially isolate for one more day. What shall we do? Let's fast and be gracious, reverent for the stars that once saved us on the high seas and desert, and for the moon's amorous pull and nourishing tug, and the sun too, because where would we be without its stubborn light, which is not preserved for us, but for the earth itself, such resplendence of which we are an afterthought in a garden some succulent ornamentation, an aberration 
a beautiful blip in time. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. That was beautiful. And I didn't mention your name just for anybody that's online that's watching. It, um, Scott Siegel. I don't know if there's a, a place to find your work. Just my name. Scott Siegel. Okay, yeah. perfect. Keith, would you mind um, pausing the feed for us?